All right, good day, fellas. Welcome to Uncensored Advice for Men. Uh, my buddy Caleb reached out to me and said, hey, I got a guy I want to introduce you to. Uh, his name's John Marsh. So John and I jumped on the call, and within a minute I go, hey, man, stop chatting for one second. Let me hit record. The stuff you're sharing with me is pretty interesting, and I want to share it with the community. Uh, so dudes, let's welcome John Marsh to the show. Welcome, buddy. Man, it's great to be here. Uh, I love the opportunity to share. Uh, my wife says I'm a little bit like the baked beans dog. You don't want to tell any secrets to me because I'll, I'll just spill it all. Or she says, you know, you're kind of like full frontal nudity. She said, just get your clothes back on. You just take them off immediately. So I'm happy to be with you in an uncensored way to share how good our lives have been and that there's hope for idiots. <laughs> there's hope for idiots, man. That might be the title for the show. So um, I have this saying, you and I might be twin brothers. You have a little bit more gray up top than I do. But I have this saying, like, I, I, I want to stand naked, unashamed, open kimono on a cold, wet day. You know, that's what, to me, that's what true community is. That's what true uh, mm. transparency is. And that's where relationships and trust are built. But uh, kind of give us, John, you know, so I, I don't want to have a nudist. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't want to have a nude off with you, but like, uh, why don't you give us your story, man? Tell us who you are and what you're up to. So my name's John Marsh. I'm in a little town called Opelika, Alabama. Think Hope You Like a, Alabama, about 30,000 people. My story is I grew up, my mom tried for 13 years to have a child, couldn't, adopted me, and 18 months later had my little brother. So I super spoiled, obeyed most everything they said till I was 13 years old and stepped across the line and did something against God and my parents I thought I could never be. Um, forgiven for. I had sex with a little girl that was 12. I rode my bike over to her house. And in doing so, I broke a covenant that I knew once you do something wrong and you figure you can't unwind it, I started rebelling from that point. And, you know, there's something about a rebellious child. Um, I say, you know, that we what we most need, we least deserve, which is praise when we're rebelling. But I rebelled, 17 years old, tried drugs for the first time, and by 23 years old, I was a million and a half dollars in debt, $99,000 overdrawn. I was going through a divorce with my wife because she left me for one of my employees who happened to be one of my banker's sons. And it drove me to the attic of my house to hang myself, hooked on meth. And so, you know, I kept hearing, kill yourself, kill yourself. And God kept saying, die to yourself, die to yourself. And it sounded so similar. I kept hearing, take your life. And God kept saying, lay your life down. And so if you get to the place where there's no hope in your future, you have no power in your present. And that's where I was. So I went up in the attic of that house and I was happy to just get it over with, lay down on an old plywood floor, cried out to a God I never knew before because I thought Jesus was some old dude that wore sandals. And I thought church was about hot dogs and hot girls. And he'd come and touch me and transform me like lightning struck me. Every hair on my body stood up. And for two solid hours, he gave me uh, injection of love and care and forgiveness that I never imagined was possible. I didn't walk an aisle and pray a prayer, but I got transformed and love got fast offense. Walked down out of that house and told my wife, she said, what are you doing? I said, I just got saved. She said, you're a liar. So I spent a year watching my wife go out on dates with this other guy. As God began to work on me, change me. And, and I didn't quit drugs and doing wrong. They quit me the day in the attic of that house. And I've walked in redemptive power since that time. Um, we worked our way out of that debt and reconciled our marriage. It took us seven and a half years of repenting one check at a time for God to build the skills. But everything we were going through had a picture of where he was taking us to. So we've loved this little town, Opelika, for 25 years. We've now um, done 280 structures, buildings in 10 blocks, started over 60 businesses to save our town. And now we steward close to $2 billion worth of redemptive real estate in 10 cities, plus still love this 10 square blocks of Opelika. So I just think if you're an idiot today, there's tons of hope for idiots. God <laughs> loves idiots. That's his niche market. He wants somebody that they know it can't be them. And so uh, we're incredibly blessed to do all we do. And uh, we're walking in something that I could only dream of, and it keeps getting better. So that's our basic story. There's a lot more to 25 years of that, but that'll give you a little a little uh, look into, you know, who we are and what we care about. Holy moly! Wow. So, 
the first mistake you made was kind of like a domino effect that really took you down a dark path. Why was that first? Why? Why? Why did that first one cause such a such an issue, cause such a problem that led you down that path? What was it? What was it about that event? You know, I had I thought about it in the past, and I never felt like two things that made me feel like that: sex and money. The, the minute I, I, I experience sex and the acceptance, you know, when a girl loves you in her way, it takes her clothes off and you guys come together, the acceptance, I'd never experienced anything like that. And I longed for acceptance. And um, two things I said, I never was confused if a girl accepted me or not. And building companies and making money, I've never been confused if our customers and clients accepted us because they paid and so it was a longing for something that only God could give. You know, it was gifts used in a perverted way. You know, the word perversion is twisted truth. And so I twisted the truth of God's gift in my life in a perverted way. I mean, what's the difference in, in uh, manipulation and motivation? It's why you do it, right? right? I mean, the same tools are used for, used for manipulation and motivation. If I manipulate you, it's good for me. If I motivate you, it's good for we. And so I just used God's gift in an unlegislated way, and it touched me, and I, and I wasn't ever the same. And, and I also believed for some reason I couldn't be forgiven. You know, and, 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 and once that was there, you know, it's like getting unpregnant. It's messy. And so you can't de-virgin yourself. Only God can de-virgin us. And, um, you know, if there's something we long for is love and forgiveness, and it's, he's got the niche market on all that. God owns the niche market of idiots. That is so interesting to hear. It sounds offensive, right? But mm -hmm. then when I look at my own life, I'm like, wow, it was because I was an idiot. It was because I got to the end of myself that I really cried out for help. And uh, that's when I realized that I can't do this on my own. That's the, that's the illusion is that I've got things under control, but then I drink too much. I eat too much. I smoke too much. I screw too much. I do whatever too much. I'm that too much kind of guy until I reach the end and I go, I am out of control. Is that what happened? We're to all, you? we're all addicts. We're just addicted to the wrong stuff. Some people it's heroin. Some people it's porn. Some people it's alcohol. Some people it's softball and some people it's church. But the only thing you can be addicted to is Jesus said it's the right thing. We're born to be addicted. Can't get enough. Love it. Crave it. Think about it all the time. We just point it the wrong direction. And so until I met him and he began to love me and I found everything that I was using that was perverted became aligned. And so I, I think where addiction is beautiful when it's pointed the right direction. And I'm not sure I've ever seen him. I've helped a lot of guys get off. We've helped reconcile over 200 broken marriages and we've helped guys get off of everything. And the only thing I can tell them is I know you'll change when you find something better. I don't want to give you a, cause the life I'd seen in Christians was a patched up old crappy Christian life. Hey, you could drive a junkie van, have an ugly wife and a blue jean skirt, live in a trailer, but man, it's going to be good. It's going to be like kingdom stuff. I thought, well, I, I mean, if that's what I got to sign up to, cause the God that met me in heaven won't that. But I really like a hot wife and a good life and a nice car. I'm not sure he gives us, but he extravagantly pours on us everything we could dream of. He said, I'll bless you and make blessings overtake you, but you don't plant corn and get apples. You reap what you sow. And if you don't like what you're sowing, you better look who's doing the, who's doing the plant. Yeah. And if we handle our money like worldly people, we'll have the kind of money they have. If we handle our marriage like worldly people, I mean, how many people, I say it's five S, I focus on faith, family, fun, fitness, and finance. And if you can't tell me you've got a sophisticated plan for your faith and your fun and your fitness, like you have on your finances, I'm going to ask you why not? Because you're telling me something's more important. And if you look at our lives, I have a sophisticated plan of all five of those. And so think about this. Money's easy to measure. How do you measure your fitness? I mean, God gave us this amazing dirt suit to ride in, and Steve Jobs would have gave you a billion dollars for this thing if he could have bought yours. You're, you are a billionaire. You got to steward this thing. How do you steward your, your family? I mean, it's the greatest gift of all. Imagine if you were rich and in great shape and your wife hated you and your kids hated you. Is that success? No. 
imagine it. How do you steward your faith? How are you putting your faith out into the world in such a way? He said, he said, if you, that God wants those who will pursue him. He said, I want those who believe, believe that I am and believe that I'm the rewarder of those who diligently seek me. And so what I, what I realized is all the answers we found to get ourselves out of that million and a half dollars that I tell you, we bet we were $99,000 overdrawn when I got saved. That's in that year, we had bounced a thousand checks, paid $19,000 in NSF fees. Now there ain't many folks that can say I was a bigger idiot than you. So, so I tell him, and I said, now I needed help in my money because it's so screwed up. And I said, here's what it's like. And going back to the first of our talking. So imagine walking out in the middle of an SEC football stadium. We're not far from Auburn. So imagine me walking into the stadium, snatching my pants down and saying, when y'all guys get done laughing, I need some help. That's what it's like sharing these areas of our life where we're broken and we need help. We've got to get transparent. We've got to get naked in a way so that God can help us. Not so you can be hurt, but so you can be helped. Yeah. You mentioned one sure way to measure acceptance, right? Is sex and money. Like that is a, those are easy ways. Am I getting booty? Yeah, I'm light. Am I, is it costing me money or am I making money? Yeah, you can measure those things. I never thought of it that, that way before. I remember, um, I waited till I was like 21 to actually have sex, but then I went wild for a few good, <laughs> yeah. few good years, <laughs> right? Because in church, man, we hold up our right hand and say, I swear I will never have sex right. when, we don't, when we're 10 years old and we don't know nothing about sex, right? So it's like an easy right. promise. And they tell you it's not any fun, which seems like a sham. You know? <laughs> Why have so many people wanting to do it right? It's like, don't say it's not fun. God built the stuff. It's really actually a lot of fun. It's just like, it's like starting a fire in the middle of your living room. It's better when it's in a fireplace, yeah. you know? So sex outside of marriage has, has consequences. It's like taking two pieces of duct tape and sticking them together and trying to pull them apart. Yeah. And the more you do it, the less you stick. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. I remember, you know, going through my wild stage and I was driving home after having two different partners in a day, right? Two, two separate girls. I hope nobody's listening to this. Mom, I'm sorry. <laughs> right. Come on. <laughs> but, uh, you know, like driving home I, from the bar or whatever, from the person's house, I, I remember crying and I was tell, asking God, I was like, I feel so lonely. Here I am getting, getting booty and, and feeling like the man, like my, my, my guy right. friends were like high-fiving me. Yet I felt so alone and so broken and so like, I felt so lonely, man. But the world would say, acceptance, you're the man, you're the this, you could drink a lot, you could do a lot. And then money, when I was making a lot of money, man, like there was times where I was working 80 hours a week, sleeping under my desk, making decent money, felt alone. That's right. Wow, I've never heard you put, I've never heard someone put it that way is, those are, those are measures of acceptance. So you said an addiction, I'm an addict. How, do you, how did you find something better? You cried out to God and hit, lightning hit you, it felt like. But like, is that the normal story for most people or what, what have you experienced? I haven't experienced it ever before with anybody else or heard of it. And I didn't even, again, I wasn't looking for it. So whatever, our stories are not powerful because of what we can say. I mean, the best testimonies are not the ones where people were so broken and the, and the worst ones are where people started serving God at eight years old. That's the wrong measurement system. I mean, I mean, do you have to poop in the pool and clean it up for it to be a good pool? This is dumb. But, but what happens is, is, is we have to live in this space of like what happened to me was supernatural for me because of where he wanted to send me. And that's the way it always is. Whatever he wants to do through you, he will do and walk with you in it. I mean, if you wonder why I've had all these different businesses and all these different things and had all these different failures, it's because he, it was where he was taking me to. If you want to know where you're going to, look at what you've been through. Because you comfort others with the same comfort you've been comforted with. I needed to be able to sit in front of men and women who are broken and who had just, I destroyed my marriage and drove my wife away. And so I had to, I had to go back and, and say, I was wrong. And so God, the first thing he asked me to do is to take, while I was watching my wife go out on dates with one of my old employees through the keyhole, God asked me to go ask him to forgive me for being a bad boss. This seems disproportionately stupid. Wow. Right? I say, God, this doesn't make any sense at all. What is wrong with you? And he said, you're forgiven in the manner in which you forgive. I'm doing this for you. 
I'm not doing this to you. And so what I had to do is I had to go to him and say, I was wrong. Will you please forgive me? Not that limp old stuff people say, please forgive me. That's a command. I was wrong. And what was I wrong for? Because I wasn't I was operating in truth, being true, lovely, and kind. These are characteristics of the kingdom. And God wanted to set me free from being locked because I wanted to screw a gun in that guy's ear and pull the trigger about 10 times. That's why God did it. So I wouldn't be imprisoned to unforgiveness through the rest of my marriage. And forgiveness is the biggest miss. If you want to know what's, what's holding us back today, forgiveness is a big one. And most people don't even know how to do it. They think it's a vaccination. One time be a woo. Glad I did that forgiveness stuff. Got that stuff out of the way. It's too hard, like getting kicked in the nuts by NFL kicker. Well, guess what? It's a second by second, minute by minute, hour by hour choice of your will that you're going to have to do till you die. That's what you're signing up for every day. And you're going to live 30 days of hell and a day of heaven. And one day it'll get to 30 days of heaven and a day of hell. But hell is after us. And I still sometimes hurt from what me and my wife went through. I still, still have to forgive. Yeah. It isn't the same, but it's still a part of it. And she has to forgive me for destroying our marriage, hurting. And my wife ended up, she's everything I dreamed of loving God. And what God began to work in me. So she kept seeing this other guy and I kept, God kept telling me, are you going to wait on her? I said, God, this is so dumb. But one thing I know, something that's lost and found can be more powerful than something that was never lost. When God redeems something, it has all the power of the kingdom in it. So what he had me do is that I didn't know how to love her because I thought loving a lady is grabbing her butt, telling her she's pretty, and get naked. That was my love thing, which I couldn't believe Ash didn't like that. She said, I don't like that at all. I thought, man, how could she not like me grabbing her butt and telling her she's pretty? This seems like just common sense. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That's not so, love? So, no. <laughs> oh, and there's man. more to there's more to marriage than sex and supper. And those are the only two measuring things. I was like, well, sex and supper were cruising. I thought this thing was working. But what ended up happening is I don't know how to love. So here's the first thing I said to God. I said, God, if love's the high jump bar of following you, I'm screwed. If I got to be patient, kind, long suffering, no records of wrongs, hopes all things, believes all things, trusts all things, and I've got to do this all the time, I'm not going to make it. Go ahead and kill me. And I felt the Lord show me. He said, no, that's not what I expected from you. That's how I'm going to be to you. I'll give it to you so you can give it away. And if I give it to you, you can give it away. And so many of us are spiritually constipated. We're taking it in, not putting it out. And love and forgiveness is God's language. And for, if God had a currency, it would be forgiveness. So he wants you to get it and give it. Don't be a reservoir, be a river. And so he began to work in me and show what he showed me. The, I'm going to give you... And I can, we can talk about all kinds of things, parenting. I'm a parent. I'm a grandparent. We still own five companies. We're still doing all kinds of things. But some of the best advice, if I only have a few minutes to give you, is one of the things is how, do you, how did I grow and, and get love back when, when it was destroyed? It's like taking a beautiful vase and throwing it on the concrete floor, shattering it into a million pieces. And God said, I'm going to rebuild it. I said, this thing's going to look like crap. You glue it all together, it's going to be all glue. He's like, no, no, no. I'm building something new with the same parts. So he wanted to build a new life within our life, and that's what he wants to do in our lives. So the question, best question I ever asked my wife is, what is the one thing I could do to show you I love you? The number one thing that I'm not currently doing. Not 10, because she had 10. The number one, she said, don't throw sweaty socks on the floor inside out. I hate it. And I said, that's really the thing? She said, yes. And so I said, we started rebuilding our marriage on sweaty socks. She had never picked up one again. And, um, and what I ended, there's a lot more to that story that we found out later through therapy, but, but it, was, it was that thing, that one thing. And the same thing with you, if you got kids, my number one question I ever asked my, my boys, I have two sons, one's 28 now, one's 20, was what is the one thing your daddy does that makes you feel the most loved? And my oldest said, daddy, take me everywhere you go. And he's still that way. At 28 years old, a man that has his own kid, he's still, when I take him somewhere, he glows. And so don't let's think we know what shows people love because we're going to say what we think. Ask them what they think, write it down and do it. It's the keys to the kingdom. Dude, you're like a, you're like a whole box of fortune cookies. Like you crack them open, you read that, that <laughs> one liner and you're like, man, I got to write that down. <laughs>
<laughs> my wife asked, can't wait for you to meet her. She said, John, you speak bumper sticker. I said, they stick. Right? <laughs> I mean, if you're simple, you have to think that way. I'm not complex. I'm simple. So in simple thoughts. And my goal is that I would be, could I be like my like my, my father in heaven who speaks simply and clearly, put the cookies on a low shelf in such a way that it's actually actionable. Yeah. All right. We got to dive into this because you said it in one of your bumper stickers and it went fast, but we got to, we got to go back to it because to me, this was, this was one of the most painful things that I had to do is go through forgiveness because I was really good at making relationships. I'm really good. I'm super extroverted. I've never met a stranger. So if someone pisses me off or screws with me, fuck them. They're gone next until until you actually find someone that you love or a family member hurts you and you can't just say F off, right? Mm -hmm. So I was forced into forgiveness. Like I had to, I mean, 10 years later into my marriage, I had to go back and forgive myself, some friends, my wife, my mom, my dad. And I went through this whole shitload of forgiveness and it was painful and I didn't have a guide to follow. So can you help us? Cause you said, the forgiveness vaccine, right? It doesn't exist. Like, boom, here's a shot. I'm better now. Booster number two, booster number 237 doesn't exist. So what, what is the, the blueprint for forgiveness? Because I don't know. Well, and I think it starts with awareness of forgiveness needs. Like we, we have nuclear waste in the basement in all of our lives, in our relationships. We came into marriage you know, you know it. Here's one way I knew it. When we start a conversation, me and my wife call our, our arguing now heated fellowship. And when we get in heated fellowship, it, it, if it starts on microwave popcorn, it always ends on your mama and your daddy. And you remember when. So if you start with something simple and end with something profound and they're in big things and big hurts, all that's nuclear waste. You can put all the concrete over it you want. You can keep layering up. I'll buy you something. But if you're having a fuss that has more energy than today's fuss, you have unforgiveness. Second, if you're in the shower and you're arguing with somebody and you win and they're not there, unforgiveness. And the first thing is awareness that you got this stuff because the key to being deceived is you don't know it. We don't know it's unforgiveness ginning up all this catastrophic destruction within our hearts and lives. And, 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 and it's, it's a conversation rolling all the time in your head where they're guilty and you're the judge. So first you got to realize that recognizing it is part of the deal. And, and here's the thing that's going to happen. You're going to suck at it just like working out or like, you know, doing anything new, go ahead and assign a period of time to suck at it. Cause you're going to suck at it. And, and that's how you start anything. Start and, and suck at it until you can get better at it. But but here's the thing. you got to practice. The number one thing is to corner your flesh. Your flesh is like a daggum lion that's been eating up a, a big roaring lion. You're gonna, you got to stick that guy in a cage and feed him stale saltines. you got to start dealing with your flesh that's always trying to be right. And, and so decide not to be right. Decide to be connected. Decide not to be you know, powerful decide to be obedient because obedience is greater than sacrifice. And here's how you know it's obedience is you won't want to do it. That's the key to obedience. It's very simple. It's like what you would used to do, don't do that. And you're going to probably start walking in obedience. I mean, just like if I thought I wanted to smack them upside the head, that probably means I need to ask them to forgive me. And the other thing is the correct understanding. So let's say you attribute 99% of your problems to your wife, man, God, it's that woman you gave me. Start in the garden, that blame game. It's that woman you gave me, Lord. Now, he got Eve. She was probably smoking hot, hand-built by God, naked, in the garden. They, they screwed the pooch on this thing. That could yeah. have been an amazing situation. Freaking but idiot. So, <laughs> so did what? Right. It started our dad, our great, 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 great grandfather's an idiot. So, But God knew we were going to go stupid. He had this great plan that he was going to pay the ultimate price to be close to us. And that he would have, if he had a refrigerator, our pictures on it, we're blessed, chosen, adopted, and loved extravagantly. And so he's paid this price. He's got us here. But so it, let's say your wife's 99% wrong and you're 1% wrong. You're 100% you're 1%. And that's the story. Get on your knees over the 1%. And you go to her and don't say anything about 99%. You start dealing on your side of the fence. I was wrong. 
Will you please forgive me? And then you wait for an answer. Now, no matter what the answer is, which will probably be, yeah, and you know what else you, and you know what else, and you know what else, go have about six balls, ten balls. They're like they're flow, throwing fat flaming bags of manure at you with holes in it. Just be prepared to keep saying, I, oh, I was wrong for that. Will you please forgive me? And when you walk away, you will have relieved a tremendous amount of pressure on the system. <sighs> you may feel a little stupid, but in your heart, you're going to feel lighter. And then you keep doing it. You keep going back that you've been forgiven so you can forgive. Now, if you don't have any forgiveness to give, right? You're looking at your, I ain't got no forgiveness in this cup. Oh, now we got a problem for you realizing where you really are in this thing. Because we receive it from him. If you don't feel you have anything to forgive, get on your knees and ask God to give you, for, show you the forgiveness you've been freely given. I mean, because think about this. You want to know how easy God will give this stuff out? I mean, God treats forgiveness. He gives it out extravagantly because he paid so much for it with intentionality. Jesus, think about this. You got a personal financial statement. Your net worth is Jesus because that's what people like us calls. Hmm. And so he paid the ultimate price for us. So receive it and give it away. Be like that thief hanging by him on the cross. I mean, if you believe in the theology of the thief, that guy didn't walk an aisle, pray a prayer, didn't get sprinkled or dunked. All he said was, remember me. And got into heaven. I think we're going to see tons of people there we wouldn't believe in heaven. I think the easiest thing in the world to do is get saved. And one of the most difficult things in the world to do is live it. Is to what? Is to live it. To live yeah. out, to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. To be being saved. To be being healed. To be being delivered. Because we walk in a dirt suit that's lined up with the wrong story. Yeah. So let me ask you a question because you've, you've helped, you know, fix 200 marriages, walk a lot of people through, you know, you said, you said you were allowed to experience a bunch of pain and issues so that one day you can help other people, right? Like you were allowed, to, you were blessed with that, right? It was which, a privilege. Which sounds freaking nuts, but like, I, I, I understand. And I it's an it. upside down kingdom, right? It's an I mean, the whole kingdom. thing, everything you, oh, you, God says I can be, I can be ambitious and content. He said, I can be dead and alive. He said, I can give and receive. That the more I give, the more I will receive. Yeah. I mean, the whole thing's upside down. It's the matrix. It's the matrix. But you've been unplugged and you got these, these uh, receptacles all over your body and you're not strong enough to stand up. Yeah. And you're Trinity. You wear the black leather suit. I'll be near. <laughs> oh, come on. No way, man. My wife's Trinity. She says that to me all the time. She is. She's, I, I love my eight-year-old son. When he was eight years old, our oldest, he's a very smart boy. I mean, and he said, he said, Daddy. I said, yeah, buddy, what is it? He said, how'd you get Mama? I said, what do you mean? He's like, whoa, Daddy, she's so hot. And you're so not. I said, you better focus on sales, little buddy. That's the only way you get a good lady. But we, I've been truly blessed. We're 30 years married this year, and I tell you, and the, the one thing I don't want to leave this show not telling people, because there's so much I want to share with men, because I have suffered greatly underneath a lot of bad decisions. I planted corn and I didn't get apples, okay? But, but one thing I think that they would want to hear is, how do you get to the place where there's not all the butts and boobs in your mind? How do we clean our mind of all these images that are wrecking us where we want to play our own porno movies with our spouses? How do we get to where we can live free and all that God intended because he built everything to do with our bodies. Yeah. But how do we get free? And that's something God showed me. Okay. Wait, wait, I... wait, 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 before you give us the secret formula on how to get boobs and butts, guys, this is your last opportunity. <laughs> Whatever boobs and butts you have in your mind, this is the right. last. This is Check the them last. out before I show you this. You just, but don't worry. They can always put them back because God <laughs> doesn't overrule people's will. You can always put them back a new version if you want. If you think it'll help, but if it would have helped, you would have already. I mean, all of us have enough, right? Yeah. I mean, it's not yeah. like we haven't got a huge catalog that we could carry with us. And you know what? What I praise God for today, I was unable to do without him that he allowed me to do. When I close my eyes, I don't see nobody naked but Ash. And that's your wife? That's right. Okay, cool. That, that, <laughs> I, did, I didn't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's amazing. But but that that's a freeing thing because now who do you think I want? 
your wife. All right. So you got to give us this, the secret formula. All right. So whoever didn't want to like get boobs and butts either had, they, they've exited the show. Exit right. Stage right. We gave them a little disclaimer. <laughs> now, oh, whoever's still secret. here, the guys who want a pure mind towards their wife or future wife, what's the, what's the formula? How do we do that? Well, what if it would make their sex incredibly better? And what if it would make their urges be more appropriate? And what if it would give them more bandwidth to build things and do things and have all the energy they want? What if their best life they could imagine sexually was ahead of them and not behind them because God had a plan for them? What if that's true? And so it isn't my formula, it's his formula. I'm an idiot that got saved. Every time I don't know what to do, I just look in the book. I mean, the book's got all the stuff in it. You know, it's not like he hid it from us. He didn't put it under a rock. And if you want to grow in God, you need to be in God's word daily. Get on your hands and knees and spend time with God daily. And spend time with people that love God. It's simple. He made it at system idiots could do. It's just that easy. And you won't have to ask anybody what God's saying. You'll know. Yeah. And hearing God moving is the name of this thing. If you can't do that, you are stuck. So getting rid of boobs and butts was... Okay. He, he, here's the thing. He, he, he said this. Take every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. And so remember, we're the gatekeepers of our mind. God put us complete stewards of our mind. You get to block things out. You get to bring things in. We choose what we think on. And the Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is he. You are what you think, okay? Mm -hmm. you, you, you live in your what you think. And so I just said, God, I'd ride down the road and I'd see pictures of Ash with that other guy. I would hear those conversations I'd listen to, and they were torturing me. I was just be weeping, and I was so angry. And I mean, I just, it was just dieseling. I couldn't stop it. And then every time she went to the grocery store, and every time she went anywhere, I was steaming that something was wrong. And so I just said, I'm not going to make it. God, two things. If you don't give me more power than I got, I'm not going to make it. And if you don't show me how to clean my mind, because that's what's killing me. You can make arms grow out of a out of a man without an arm or make blind eyes see, but that means nothing to me if you can't heal where I'm riding, which is inside my head. And so I, he, I believe in the scripture. He showed me that this scripture, and I only knew one scripture because I was an idiot and got saved. I went to Baptist church, you know, that's, that's the only place I knew to go big Baptist church. Me and Ash show up there. I, I take a little rabbit trail for a minute. We show up in this big newlywed Sunday school room and a bunch of tables of people sitting and we're like sitting down there. We're like, whoa. And they're like, any prayer requests? I was like, oh, oh, oh me, me, because I didn't know you should be anxious to say stuff like that. I was like, my hand up. And they're like, yeah, yeah, new couple. And I was like, oh, I was like, me and her cussed each other all the way to church. She's still seeing this other guy. We're screwed up. Can y'all help us? <laughs> all the tables, chairs moved. And we were like, oh, dang. Like we had leprosy. And like then, the, and I kind of got the picture. The next guy was like, uh, what's his prayer request? Like, Unspoken. And then the next guy was like, uh, you know, my cousin's toe in Idaho's hurting. I thought, baby, we're too screwed up for these people. Yeah. I said, we need Jesus. We can't do this. We, we have to have life. We're too screwed up. Then people kind of fixed up. We're screwed up. We need help. And so what, what ended up happening is the Baptist so they gave me this little thing called a survival kit. It had you 30 days to read your Bible and these little scriptures you memorize. I did every 30 days. And I want to tell you. I hadn't stopped since in 20, 28 years, 27 years, I've been in the Word of God, and I've been loving on and honoring God. I don't, they say, well, I don't have time for that, so don't wear your pants. How many times you go out without pants? Leave your pants at the house and read the Word. If you got to choose, go without pants, because it's more important. Yeah, John said the it. The Word of God, there's, <laughs> there's nothing more important. Than so, so here's what I got. That one scripture I memorized there, Psalms 119, thy word. I have hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Okay. And every time I was driving down the road, you know, and a big set of boobs would pop in my head or some, some other part. And I'd be like, dang, like, how did that come in here when I was just thinking about whatever lunch? And um, I, I realized our minds are the most complex filing cabinets that's ever been built. And so whenever I pull one up and see some butts and boobs, I'm like, I stuck a little word in there, put the file back down. And through a system of just constantly taking thoughts captive and putting a piece of word in there, that word cleaned the whole file again. Hmm. And so it's just that simple. If, you'll, if you care and you want to take every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ and place a piece of word in there, I promise you, whatever is plaguing you in your mind will be redeemed.
Yeah. Super cool. Super cool. We are kind of like the matrix. I got to go backwards, right? Okay. Or maybe even Quentin Tarantino. I got to go, I got to go backwards in the story a little bit. You mentioned, I heard kill yourself. And what God was saying was die to yourself. I heard there was a few others that you said, take your life. And he was saying, lay your life down and see that suicide is a, is an ultimate, in my opinion, guys, and I've been there with the rope about to do it and, um, and really not scared of anything other than the rope would hold. And, and what it is, is um, it's a, it's an unction that I believe is misinterpreted. We know we're supposed to lay our lives down. We know we were built to, to lay our lives down so that God would give us one. We know we have to die. I mean, he says this, you're crucified with Christ. That word is co-crucified with Christ. And yet not I live, that's Galatians 2.20, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live in this flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Do you see? We know we're supposed to be dead men. We know it. But we don't know what to do with it, so we misinterpret. So I guess I ought to kill myself. Well, how many people are killing themselves today, my friend? You go into a room, 20% of the people who are listening to this podcast with us are thinking about it. Yeah. And so I'm here to tell you it's a lie. It's a lie. Don't believe the father of lies. There's a father that loves you of peace, and he's calling you. When you die, you will live. If you'll lay your life down for his sake, you'll surely find it. And the life I long for has been hid up and wrapped up in, in giving myself over to the king of the universe. I mean, I can't lose for winning. I feel like a mosquito in a nudist colony. Opportunity is everywhere. Huh. Now, as you're doing this and, you know, this conversation, uh, there's guys in the audience who do not have the same beliefs as you, do not, you know, know about Jesus, God, all this stuff. But they might be uh, on the five F's. They might feel like they're checking all the boxes. Maybe maybe they're missing the, the F in faith. Right. Like sure. what 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 do you say to a dude who has it all made? He's he's rocking all those other four F's just fine. And things are going well for him. I don't pretend to tell other people what to do. You know, I'm, I'm not, I didn't go to cemetery or seminary. I don't know anything about that stuff. I'm an idiot that got saved and I just got into this thing and it worked for me and stuff that works is pretty darn easy to understand. I mean, don't take a, so if you've got something that's working for you, but if you ever get to the place where you wish, you wish you felt loved, you wish you felt accepted, you wish you felt forgiven. If you ever get to the place that the way you're living is not giving you what you dreamed of, and you you start looking in everything else, try God. I mean, it, he'll meet your needs, and you don't have to walk an aisle and pray a prayer, do some of that church stuff, because church is primarily in the U.S. like a crappy country club, big dues and no fun. And I didn't want what they had. There wasn't, like I said, a lot of people who knew how to make money or had hot wives or did cool stuff, so that's a big problem for me, because I didn't want junky stuff. So maybe they don't want that, but if they'll get down on their hands and knees, and just start talking to the king of the universe. That's the answer. I mean, I tell people, if you're lacking what God, if you want to know if he's real, just get down on your hands and knees and tell him how good he is till he meets you. Well, he ain't got to have his sprinkled or dunked or any of that other stuff. You ain't got to wonder. <laughs> yeah. Hey, man, you're, you're, you're really awesome. I'm, I'm sure we'll do more of these conversations. Um, during this interview, man, are there any questions that I should have asked you that I didn't ask you? There's so many things. I mean, again, what am, maybe what am I passionate about today? Like what, what, what's happening in my life outside of, I mean, I don't know. I don't ever know what, you know, I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm just full frontal nudity. I just say whatever's on my heart. So I, I'm not trying to have a, a Christian program. I love business. I can talk about business as passionately as we're talking about this, or I can talk about assets and redemptive real estate, which I love. So, I mean, we, I believe there's four things I do that when I do it, I have the gift on my life to do it from God. That's when I help people grow personally, when I help them love God passionately, when I help them do good work purposefully, and when I help them live intentionally. Those are the four things that's like a little rock in a shepherd boy sling, take out giants. When I do it, it works. And and I love people and places. We We love our city. We still own about 200 properties in these 10 square blocks. 
we're doing all kinds of stuff from boutique hotels to restaurants to all that. And then I'm traveling all over America to cool people doing the same thing. Our largest portfolio is in Winter Haven, Florida. Our clients there steward about 80 blocks of downtown Winter Haven. 610 and um and they've they've got about a 150 million dollar portfolio and half of that's been raised from 60 locals so we we've been helping them steward that our smallest city is a city of um, 800 called bloomfield kentucky and so um we're there and then we're also up in illinois we have a couple that's buying a whole town in alito illinois so i just i mean my prayer is always front row seats to miracles 50 yard line seats to miracles and it's been a it's been amazing, and I, I think, uh, you know, I'm as sophisticated and as thoughtful about business as I am about faith as I am about my fitness as I am about my finances and about my fun and my family. So let's do a comparison, right? When you were laying on the plywood floor thinking of killing your life or killing yourself, right, like – mindset there right and the challenges you were facing there right so we we've heard about that on the show now that you're out of the hole financially now that you've got ten thousand businesses you know and you're crushing it and all that stuff what mindset challenges are you evolving or are you growing or, or working through now like what wh where are you learning to f grow now what, what what challenges and mindset do you have now well um one thing is my mentor, one of my, my longest mentors, 26 years, he grew up in a mill village with a high school education, ran the largest real estate company in the world. He helped build Century 21. He told me, he said, I'll help you when, when I was an idiot, but you got to answer three questions. How much is enough? What are you going to do when you get enough? And what's your living plan and your giving plan? And um, so, you know, I, the how much is enough? We drew a financial uh, finish line. And we're there. That's fine. We don't need any more assets. We don't need any more businesses. Um, now, it may not be a lot to some people, but it was what we said we were willing to do. Number two, we give extravagantly. We've got a giving goal every year, and I feel our goal is to give away homes. That's what we love doing in our city to people who never have one. And then what I want to do with my life is the question. So my number one challenge right now with all the gifts and opportunities I have, what am I going to do with what I've been entrusted? Hmm. What does my preferred future look like? Like I've got so many years left, whatever that is, and I'm writing checks for my life. Now, what am I willing to write checks for my life for? And for me, it must support three capitals, social, spiritual, and economic capital, because that's the amazing story of the Good Samaritan, social, spiritual, and economic capital. And so for me, am I do, can I please my Sunday school teacher and my economics teacher with everything I do? Is that possible? Because we don't see that a lot, right? We see people that are doing things that are about their faith, and we do things that are doing profitable businesses. But what about if you could do all that together? What if you could do good and do well? That's that's where we want to live, and that's what I'm wrestling right now. Like, all of our businesses are growing like crazy, but every time I say yes, I'm saying no to 100 things, yeah. and I don't have a lot of margin. I mean, I'm using all the time I have, and I've got to figure out, you know, is this – it's just not what I'm doing right now is not enough for where I'm going. Dude, you're so cool, man. Um, let's do this for, for guys who want to follow you, connect with you, learn more from you with you. What's a good place for guys to, uh, to do that. Two places. Um, they can see my podcast, which is redemptification.com. Think gentrification redeemed R E D E M P T I F I C A T I O N redemptification.com or Marsh Collective is our group of companies. And uh, those are two good places to find out about us. Um, cool. They can see. So if we awesome. can add value. We want to do it. Awesome, We're big awesome, farmers. Awesome. Guys, uh, guys listening in, thank you for uh, tuning in. As always, reach out to our guests. Say thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for skiing 
full naked into this nudist camp, as John would say. But just being transparent, man, I I, I want to applaud the guys and, and gals who come on the show and share their advice. So thank you, John, for doing that. Guys, if you if you need some help, head on over to uncensoredadviceformen.com. Fill out a quick form. I'll connect you with one of my past guests or maybe with some resources that we have. Or if you have some advice to share with other guys, head on over, uncensoredadviceformen.com. Fill out a quick form. Maybe get you on the show next. Till then, talk to you guys on the next episode. Love you guys.